Okay, good seeing everybody this morning. Um, you know, uh, we got a chance to go to the flick last night. Went to the movie, uh, <coughs> me and Sue and PJ and Kristen. We went and saw that Apostle Paul movie. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, I like a movie where they try to at least, you know, portray it accurately. Uh, you know that Noah flick? The only scriptural thing about that movie was the title. <laughs> and it went downhill after that. I have no idea why they even wasted their time to make a movie and call it Noah. when It had nothing to do with the Noah the Bible. <clears throat> at least this one... Uh, you know, kind of focused on Paul's prison time uh, in Rome. And, you know, I thought they brought out some, some good points. So it, it was kind of, kind of good to watch that. You know, you think about uh, those days, you know, in the Roman Empire. You know, that's the thing about the Scripture, the brevity of the Scripture. The Bible talks about all kinds of stuff that was going on, but we tend to read right over it. You know, I was thinking, you know, like with the Passion Flick, you know, I remember when that first came out, and, uh, you know, they had some news people there at the theater and filming people coming out, and, you know, some of these girls come out crying, oh, I didn't know he suffered so much. What's in the Bible? <laughs> it's, you know, it says, and they crucified him. One, two, three, four words. The brevity of Scripture. And they crucified him. But when you take the time to go watch what that probably looked like, yowzers, you know, man, that was brutal. The scourge was really something. And that, if you've ever read anything, like I remember reading in the Antiquities, which is early Christianity, they said that Roman scourge could kill a man, could disembowel them, rip their guts out. Because they put metal and glass and various things in those whips that when they lit into you with that, I mean, it ripped the hide right off you. And he was scourged, a Roman scourge. So it's in the Bible, but sometimes we kind of read over those things. Paul said he was in labors more abundant, stripes above measure, prisons more frequently, deaths often. Oh, young. Uh, of the Jews, five times I received the 40 stripes minus the one, three times beaten with rods, once stoned, day and night in the deep. Uh, yeah, woo, wow, yeah, amen, brother. Those are just words till you fletch them babies out a little bit. And then when you get to see what that might look like, you know, I don't know if you've any, been in any dungeons lately. Uh, I know one that sticks with me is the Hanoi Hilton in Hanoi, North Vietnam, where they kept our prisoners for years and tortured our pilots incredibly, put them in what they called the suitcase, used ropes to pull their arms behind their back and put their boot in their back and pull those ropes and rip their shoulders out of the sockets bring their legs up over their shoulders. They called it being put in a suitcase because they packaged you up so small you could fit in a suitcase. They would throw up. They would defecate, scream. They'd stuff dirty rags in their mouth. That's what the Hanoi Hilton was like. Part of that prison is still there today, and you can go in there and look. And we've looked in the, I think Jamie was with me one time, come to think of it, but Don and I just went there, Don Malinowski. We were there in Hanoi this last uh, December. And you can look in those cells and see the concrete, the chains, the shackles that some of those prisoners stayed in for years. I think the, the longest one held was probably about eight years, Alvarez, in there. So Paul was in his prison last night in the movie. You could see that. It wasn't no Holiday Inn, that's for sure. But, you know, this is what the Roman officer was trying to communicate to him. What are you guys all about anyway? You ain't winning nothing. I'm me paraphrasing a little bit. You're all a bunch of slaves. You're in the arena. 
Where's your God, man? Are you kidding me? And that's what the movie was showing. There was a lot of fear. Nero burned Rome and blamed the Christians for it, and that's history. Nero used Christians as street lights. He'd tie them to poles and soak them in fuel oil or kerosene and light them on fire, and the, the streets were lined with burning bodies. God let that happen? Yeah. Yeah. He let Paul be in prison. He let Paul uh, be stripes above measure, prisons frequently. You know, those are not nice places. Uh, deaths often, beatings, 40 stripes, minus the one. Got that five times or uh, three times beaten with rods, stones, hunger, thirsting, fasting, nakedness, cold. Perils of robbers, perils of the, of the Gentiles, of wilderness, perils in the sea. Is he on the winning side? <laughs> is this the winning side? This is, what, this is what the world looks at and says, are you guys out of your minds? What good is that Christianity for you? Where is your God, man? You see, there were many in the, in the movie, in the church, which has been true. They were in fear. They were hiding. And they wanted to fight back. They wanted to get their sword. We need to fight. And others were going, no. Remember they said what the Lord said, what Paul said. Don't overcome evil with evil. Overcome evil with good. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Well, that sure rubs our fur the wrong way, man. How's that going to work? How's that going to work? You know, we have a tendency to want to make it go away when we're trying to help people. We really do want to bring a message, man, that takes people that are really hurting or people been through some stuff and make them see what it's all about to say, yes, yes, I want that, I want that. But a lot of times that's not what we, we can't make it go away. And that's really what they want you to do. I think I told you about the time I had a co-worker. Uh, actually, both of them, husband and wife, worked at the Federal Center. And she was diagnosed with MS. And they were like in a panic. I mean, just in a panic. And they, they want to talk to me. You know, they're kind of worldly. And uh, you know, I knew what they wanted to talk about. I went over to their house. And she was a pretty gal. And... You know, the idea of this MS slowly going to destroy her, I mean, they just couldn't deal with it. And, you know, they would love to have somebody come over there and lay hands on her. Heal, you know, and make it all go away. You know, Jesus could do that. Wow. People were coming. They were bringing their, their people from all over. <clears throat> They're disabled. Their loved ones. Well, wouldn't you? Looking for this Jesus guy? Then he gave that power to the apostles, you know, that he could even do it too. Casting out demons, raising the dead. Wow. But you know what? When you really, really step back and look at it, you do not want the hassle of that. We do not want that hassle because that's why Luke 17 is so good to look at that context of 10 lepers getting healed. Man, they wanted to be healed, right? I mean, would you want leprosy? Would you want your body parts falling off? Dead while you live? Have to be isolated, separated, couldn't be around other people? Have to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away from you? You couldn't do nothing, man. Lord Jesus, Master, have mercy. Go show yourself to the priest. As they went, they saw they were healed. A man, one come back and threw himself down, giving thanks to God, man. He's a Samaritan. Jesus said, where did them other guys go? One, two. Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Where are mother nine? Oh, they went to the church building. Nine, that's what, went to the synagogue. Sure they did. They went right to fire keepers, man. They went right to the casino. <laughs> they went to the little clubs man wherever they went I don't know we don't need the hassle of thousands and thousands of people wanting to come down here to see what they could get 
and then go run off and go do whatever. We have a message that'll make a person whole. It'll make them clean, give them quality of life. The God of hope can fill them with all joy and peace and believing they can abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. They will never die. And people look at you and go, well, they want that. But when they realize you're talking that spiritual stuff, oh, that. You should have seen the countenance fall, these two people I was talking to, and I had to give them the big picture. Look, here's the deal. This is the way the world is. It has suffering in it, sickness, death, wars, rumors of war, earthquakes, famine, pestilence in various places. We, through much tribulation, Paul said, will enter the kingdom of God. I said, you can't have quality of life now from the inside out. Ain't going to make the MS go away. You should, I mean, you could hear it hit the ground. Boom. Oh. I thought, <laughs> this ain't cheering them up much. But, you know, that's what people want. They want it here. They want it now. Hot now, you know. They don't want to die so that they can live. I get that. I get that. You know, when I was in Kosovo in Belarus, you know, whatever, a couple weeks ago, um, you know, go to the same places. I'm sitting there in Kosovo in Mitra Beach, and I'm talking to uh, Mr. Byram in a room full of pictures on the wall of the missing. Women, men, missing. Thousands of people missing. You know what? That wasn't 500 years ago. That was in our lifetime. That kind of stuff. Killing those people, mass graves, rape, 22,000, used as a weapon of war in Kosovo. Burned all the homes for miles and miles and miles and miles. And when you went from the airport in Pristina to go up to where Java Duraco lived, both sides of the road, houses burned. Just raped the whole countryside. In our lifetime. Our lifetime. You guys heard Avni. He was here. You know, Avni Aldemai talked about five years in prison, Serbs beating him, torturing him, broke his back, all that stuff. That prison, that guy that mows the lawn out here, old Benny. Troy introduced me to Arvin Shabani, Benny. I was in Mitrovic with Benny. We were in a, in a coffee shop, and this guy came up to the table about Benny's age. And he comes up, speaks in Albania, and he's kind of walking like this, and he has a cigarette. And Benny jumped up and grabbed the guy, was hugging the guy, and Benny was so excited to see the guy. Got him sat down, and while he's talking to him in Albanian, he'd look at me and say, I went to, went to high school with him. Uh, he was my best friend. You know, blah, 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 I'm talking, and the guy, yeah, yeah. and I'm looking at this guy thinking, yeah, he is drunk or a skunk or something. So we had to get up and go. Benny was saying something to him like goodbye, you know, and you give him a big hug. And, and he was going, man, that guy, he was the best athlete in our school and, and all that. And Benny's all emotional. And I said, Benny, kind of looked kind of drunk, wasn't he? He said he wasn't drunk. He said, you know that prison that Abney was in? They did that to him in that prison. They destroyed him in that prison. He said, he ain't drunk. The guy was a wreck. Then he said, no, they did that to him in there. Talking to these people, they're trying to find their loved ones. Our, uh, Byram, his, his son's missing. You know, you, we go see the disabled. I go to the homes of the people with the children with disabilities. Everyone wants their loved ones healed. You know, we all would love to see Michael get right up out of that chair. And guess what? He will. He will. I don't remember that country song. It was a long time ago about a little boy. He was disabled and finally died from it. And it says that he ran off to play. And when you had to put that together, when you heard the song, it meant he died. And he ran off to play. 
because that's our hope. That's what they told them in the movie last night. The Christians were in the prison and the circus was about to begin where they were going to be fed to the wild animals and various things in the arena. They didn't show that part. But as they all kind of were being led out into the walking into the daylight into the arena while the crowd was cheering, Luke was in the movie. Not that's not necessarily a. It's Luke of the Bible, but it, it. I'm not saying this part is in the Bible, but anyway, Luke encouraged them before they went out. There was kids, women, men. He said, "Look." It'll only hurt for a minute, and then it'll be over. And you'll be with the Lord. You'll be in glory. It's only going to hurt for a minute. You see, we can't make it go away. We've got a message of hope. And I know that's hard sometimes when people are scared and people are hurting and people are suffering. And you keep talking about a hope somewhere where they can't tangibly experience that in their own mind. Does it make it any less real? When you read the Bible, you see that is exactly what the people suffered. It's a historical fact that Nero burned Rome and blamed the Christians for it. And they were put to death for it. They were beaten, tortured, burned alive. It happened and God allowed it, yes. You see, that's why it takes us back to go, then what is going on around here? If Christianity isn't doing me any good right now, then what good is it? If my hope is only after I'm dead, then what's the point of all this? Is God just getting his kicks out of this or something? You see, a whole lot is being communicated to the angelic realm because they're the ones watching. It said that Abraham believed God and righteousness was imputed. He absolutely trusted in God and God was glorified, it says, in Abraham. You know how the Bible says that God declares the end from the beginning? The book of Job, you know, I think just recently I kind of Hit, you know, explain to, you know, it said that the, the book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible, and I think I give you a quick crash course on how you can know that. The, Job is the oldest book of the Bible because Moses wrote the first five books. It says so. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, obviously, the Genesis account covers the creation of the world. You'd think that's about as far back as you could go. True. Moses wasn't in the creation. He was inspired by God to write about him. So that doesn't make Genesis the oldest book in the Bible. Moses is 430 years after Abraham. He's way after the flood. Job is a patriarch. We can kind of conclude that because when God tells him to offer sacrifices for his three dumb friends so God would accept them, there's no indication he's a Levite or a priest or any such thing. So, but the point is, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Job, what you see is a righteous man. A righteous man, a well-respected man, the richest guy in the East. Job. But then it says that in verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, blameless, upright man who fears God. God and it shuns evil. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? You've made a hedge around him and around his household and all around that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions increased in the land. You stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He'll curse you to your face. Woo! Would he? There's angels standing there listening to that. They're the ones who watch. Did they know Job? Yep. 
Then Satan makes an accusation. God said, you see my servant Job down there? He's an upright guy. Righteous. Hates evil. Fears me. Satan says, he ain't nothing. He's a phony like all the rest of them down there. You, you build that hedge. You, you're the candy man is all you are to him. You take away his stuff, he curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Don't touch him. You know what the devil does? He gets a chance at you and without any restrictions. Boom, you know the story. Ten kids dead. Flocks, herds, servants, killed, taken. In other words, everything he had physically. God didn't let him touch him. All in one afternoon. Talk about a bad hair day. So what happens? 20, verse 20, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell down the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked I come in from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And who saw that? Wasn't the neighbors. It's the angelic realm. And some of them angels, I just like to picture the righteous, the glorious ones. Yeah! Woo! Now, Job had no idea what the heck just happened. His whole world just blew up. Chapter 2 said again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also with them to present himself before the Lord. Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Say, of Satan answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and back and forth in it. Lord said to Satan, if you consider my servant Job, there's none like him on the earth, blameless, upright man, who, one who fears God, shuns evil. And still he hold fast as his integrity, although you entice me against him to destroy him without cause. So the devil answered and said, so Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man have, he'd give for his life. Man, do anything save his hide. You stretch out your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh. He'd surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, behold, he's in your hand. But spare his life. Job gets hit with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He has no idea what's going on. Even his friends, when they came over, they had to just sit there and stare at him for days. Because nobody said a word. They sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw his grief was very great. Man, you don't even want to say the guy. Like, man, Job, man, what'd you do? He said, I ain't did nothing. And you must have. You must have, man. And <laughs> it must have been bad. He said, I ain't did nothing. I'm paraphrasing a little bit in case you didn't know. You see, they didn't know. They're trying to figure it out. Even Job didn't know. He kept maintaining his integrity, though. He knew he didn't sin. He knew, but he didn't know why. He said, God, I'd like to talk to you about this. You know, maybe you could talk about this. Of course, when the time comes, I want to get off this book of Job, but it's kind of funny. God says, all right, you want to talk? Stand up. Gird yourself like a man. You want to talk? Let's talk. Where were you when I laid the foundation? Of the I mean, he started firing old questions to Job. Job's like, oh, oh, you're, you know, I'm just dust. Sorry about that. I mean, I, <laughs> what are you going to talk to God about? You couldn't answer one of his questions. God said Job was upright. He blessed Job. He restored everything. The only thing, and I'm not going to, you know, I'll just give you the verse, you know. Uh, it's like in Job 29, uh, talks about two through six, where Job just refers to, oh, how I wish I was as in the months past. Now, the only reason why I bring that up, because some people wonder, how long did he go through that stuff, man? 
The only thing I can find in the book of Job, he says, in the months past, how I wish I was, you know, back there. So months, it wasn't something he went through for a couple weeks. Months. And he didn't get the 10 kids. He got kids back, but not the same ones. Okay? And how long can you, I mean, how long does it take you to get kids back? A little while. But God restored Job. That played out before the angelic realm. My point is, the Bible's telling us, the oldest book in the Bible, look, fasten your seatbelts, pilgrim. It's always been this way. And it's going to be this way. That's why it's good that we get that, that insider information, that behind-the-scenes information to look. We need an expectation of what we can expect as Christian people in this crazy, violent, dark world. You see, where God is glorified is when people by faith know God. They see him. Their eyes of their understanding open. We're not about going around blowing sunshine up people's noses. When I'm sitting in houses in Kosovo talking to people that saw their daughters raped, their kids were shot in front of them, husbands dragged away, executed like Javid's brothers. I mean, what family I'm talking now? People that have been here have been through that. What are you going to say to them? Like these guys, Job's friends, they were stunned. They sat there for seven days staring at him, and nobody said a word because what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Can't make it go away. God allows it. In that movie, they had uh, Luke got into the prison kind of they had to bribe their way in and he was in there with Paul you know those prison epistles you know Ephesians Colossians Philippians and Philemon Paul literally wrote those in prison he was in prison he told Timothy about the chain he said but the word of God ain't chained easy <clears throat> being in those prisons and he's writing this these letters. I came home from the, the movie theater because I had to be on Skype at 10 o'clock last night for the brethren in Vietnam. And I was thinking to myself, what a contrast. An hour ago, I'm in a movie theater watching Paul being in a prison where they just had torches for lights and, you know, straw and, you know, just a dungeon. And now I hustle home so I can boot the old pad up, you know, the iPad and, uh, get Skype on there, and I'm the brother in there. They're all sitting there. I don't remember. There's about 20 of them, <clears throat> and uh, you could hear the roosters <laughs> just as loud and clear coming through, and then, well, I'm talking to people on the other side of the world, man, looking right at their faces in this little gizmo. I mean, we've come a long ways, baby. You know what I mean? From old quill pens on parchment with torches in prisons. And now I'm looking right into a communist country, man. And they were, the interpreter wasn't there yet, and they were going to do a baptismal, so they thought, let's do that now. So they had their portable tank filled up just outside where the roosters were at. And, and this guy, about 40 years old, was getting immersed, and I took Sue's phone because I was using mine as the hotspot. And I actually videotaped them baptizing this guy and then his 60-year-old mother right there. And I'm thinking, this is so bizarre. To, this is just crazy that we have the kind of technology that I can watch somebody being immersed into Christ on the other side of the planet in real time. Roosters and all. Yeah. Isn't that spooky stuff? Now, who do you think's behind that? Who do you think gave us that technology? Do you think God had maybe an idea that maybe we could use this stuff? You know, that, that tells me he's for us. You understand what I'm saying? If God's gone that far, that give us a hint that virtually nothing is impossible for the gospel to go forward in this world. 
Now, granted, the Internet's used for a whole lot of other things besides that, for sure. The devil's got his hands in all that. But we can use it because that's what it was actually designed for, was for the glory of God, not for people's entertainment and their perversions. I spent time in the drug and alcohol places in Belarus, probably at four of those. One I might have told you, there's a shelter that Olga Goncharenko uh, likes to, you know, we've supported that shelter. Windows, things for the kids, blah, blah, blah. A shelter is where kids are brought when they're first taken from their homes by the government. Um, if the home situation isn't corrected in six months, the kid, the family loses their parental rights and the kid goes to the orphanage until they're old enough to go out on their own. Okay. So at the shelter, we got a chance. They brought a whole bunch of kids, teenagers, high risk from the community. These weren't kids that were technically in the system yet, but they were going to be. Had a whole room full of them. And the idea was that uh, Olga wanted me to talk to them as being a former social orphan myself and been through the system. And so we did that. But then another day, the next day, the, the, the shelter director, a guy named Vaslov, he's really a pretty nice guy. He had parents brought in, like five different couples of parents whose kids had either been taken, will be taken if they don't get their act together. And you can see it in their face. They're alcoholics, mom and dad. One mom had been in prison, just recently released. They're going to lose their kids. This is serious stuff when you're going to lose your kids. Vassilov told me, he said, you go in there and talk to them. He said, I don't care what you say to them. You can tell them about God, whatever. I said, no problem. So me and Alan and Big Mike went in there. And that's what I did, talk to them parents. I said, hey, you know, you know, I wanted to make it clear. You know, we're glad to be here. We're, you know, we just like to help the shelter out a little bit, but it's great being able to talk to you guys too. You know, we do a humanitarian type aid work and all that. I'm trying to make them feel comfortable. We're foreigners, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but I had Ole again there, good interpreter, you know, and uh, I told him, you know, I can really relate to the situation you're all going through. I said, I struggled with alcohol for years. Years and years. And, of course, they look at me kind of surprised. You know, I'm American. I'm rich, you know. I mean, what problems I got? I said, no, I was exactly in the same boat. Dysfunctional family. You know, violent father. Mother commits suicide. Become a social orphan. Same kind of thing here with the shelter and your kids and the, all that. And, you know, they're like, I said, you know, man, it was a struggle to get out of there, but I, I finally made it, man. I said, I really was messing up my life. I said, I look for answers. I said, there's answers out there. I had to go back to the Creator, though. I said, you know, there's nobody else I could see to turn to, including church. I said, I, I didn't talk to church people because I was drinking with church people. What do they know? I said, but I went to and I started looking for God. I felt after him, and I found him. And Jesus said, come to me, you that labor heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon and learn from me. I'm meek and lowly at heart. He said, you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. These people are looking at me. I said, you know, I ain't preaching at you. I said, I'm not preaching to you. I'm telling you. I'm just telling you. There's a way it is. And the Bible, I said, actually talks about a process. It's called the transformation of the renewing of the mind. That's what the Apostle Paul said. If you've heard Jesus, he'll teach you. And if you'll listen to him, You'll put off concerning your old man, your formal conduct. You'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You can put on a new man created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. You can overcome substances, alcohol, all that. And the, and the, the anger and the fear that you have that leads you to the alcohol, destroying your lives, your families. I said, again, I ain't preaching at you. I'm just telling you. I said, I'll tell you what, if you're interested, I'd be glad to. Stop by your place and share some of this with you of how it works. I mean, if you're interested and they're going, you know, like raising their hand, nodding their head, yeah, yeah. So we're going to take this Skype stuff, you know what I mean? I talked to Olga. Obviously, I couldn't stay there. I'm home, right? 
but I can't wait six months to go back over there and tell them how this thing works. So I talked to Olga. I said, hey, we need to find out. Is there internet out there in the boon sticks where they're at out there? Because if there is, what we need to do is get, you know, if they have a TV at the shelter, we'll put them in that same side room we were in. And, uh, you know, you'll come, Olga, she interprets real good, speaks great English. You know, come on down and we'll do the, the study right over the Internet, man, with those families. I don't want them waiting six months. See, this is serious stuff. They're going to lose their kids or go back to prison. People are hurting. And that's not just a Belarusian thing, and I made it clear to them. I said, this is not a culture thing. This is a human thing. It affects all people all over this world. The darkness, the violence, the destruction of people's lives and their home. I know people want it to go away. It ain't going away. We got to overcome it, Jesus said. He said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. He said, be a good cheer. I've overcome the world, and so will you. And so will you and me. That's how it's done. That's what Paul was in the movie trying to explain to that Roman authority that had him in the prison because the guy couldn't figure out, what are you all about, man? You guys ain't winning. Look at you. Look at your people. Look at the people that follow you. He kept trying to figure out, what are you getting out of this? You getting money for this, man? What, is this your pride or what? You know, Paul said, nope, nope. I, ain't get, I never took a dime for any of it. Wasn't making money. And the guy was trying to figure it out. And see, that's one of the strongest evidence for the truth of Christianity because good men died for it and got nothing. What you would think in this world. You know, money, prestige, fame, chief seats in the synagogues or at the big parties with the elites. Quite the opposite. That's one of the most powerful evidences for the fact that Christianity is true. Because the faithful died for it and didn't get anything. Not in this life. That's not normal. Normally, people do want to make merchandise out of you. In fact, it tells you in 2 Peter chapter 2, that's what some of these will do. They'll take and make merchandise with the gospel. And I don't need to tell you that. Turn your TV on on Sunday and look at some of those highfalutin preachers like that Joel Holstein guy and some of them others. They're rolling in dough, man. But I digress. Quickly, we'll just run down to. Remember what Paul says in Romans. Go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at Romans 8. Verse 18, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yes, the sufferings of this present time. <clears throat> already mentioned in John 16 what Jesus said be of good cheer in the world you have tribulation but be of good cheer I've overcome the world when you go to Acts chapter 14 Acts chapter 14 the apostle Paul gets himself stoned but is raised back up Acts 14 19 the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them, to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Stoning and strengthening, all in the same context. Huh. How about that? Somehow that seems like an oxymoron. Stoning and strengthening. 
You know what Paul would say? You know, if you go there, what is it? In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, I always thought this was kind of amusing. Speaking of those same places right there where they went in Iconium and at, at Lystra, look what he says. Verse 11. Well, actually, verse 10. Speaking to Timothy here, you have verse... Uh, 2 Timothy 3.10 You have carefully followed my doctrine manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance persecutions afflictions which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium Lystra what persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me yes and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will Suffer persecution. Hallelujah. Look, he said all these things he suffered that happened to him there, persecutions that he endured, and yet he says, out of them all the Lord delivered me. Well, which is it? Did he endure those things or was he delivered from those things? Yes. Yes. See, that's not how we think. If you're going to get delivered, you know, it'd be like getting up after being stoned, you know. Lord, <clears throat> if you was going to raise me up anyway, could we have maybe avoided that part in the first place? Why did I have to go through the stoning if you was just going to raise me up anyway? Well, my strength is perfected in your weakness, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Problem? Problem? Well, I guess not. You know, God has his ways of doing things that bring glory to his name. He said, look, I'm going to make this right for you. I'm, like Paul said, that I think the sufferings he said at this present time ain't even worthy to be mentioned or compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. He said, God going to make it right. God going to make it right. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, us, which he hath prepared beforehand for glory? God says, look, I know you didn't ask to be here. I know you didn't ask to be here. And you're going through some stuff. He said, but I'll make it right. In fact, I'll make it more than right. You'll never regret it, is what he's saying. You'll like it. You'll like it. But by faith, he wants to give us the information that opens our eyes up so we can actually see, yes, yes, count me in. I want to be a part of this. The early Christians went through way more, brother. We're kind of fortunate to be here. I told you about the people in Vietnam. I first heard about them because many of them had been in prison and were beaten, some killed, cut their heads off with a hole, one guy said. That was from that group. That's the same people that Bill McDonough told me about when I was looking for the church in Vietnam. That's that group that men has got with him. It's them same folks. Strengthening the brethren, it says they did. You know what? We can encourage one another, and going through our trials, we can be an encouragement and strengthen one another. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll just get a couple more, we're going to be done. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, Therefore we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man being renewed day by day for our light affliction. Now remember this guy in 2 Corinthians 11 listed all that stuff he'd been through. This light affliction, which is only for a moment, of course, <clears throat> is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, it's too depressing, but the things that you're not seen, for the things that you're seen are temporary, but the things that you're not seen are eternal. He's, he's telling us where to look, setting our mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You look at things seen, you're going to get depressed. We've got to look above, beyond that. You know, Peter makes it very clear in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we have our hope, it's reserved in heaven for us, 
inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Got your name on it, 1 Peter 1 and 4. Who are kept by the power of God. Hey, God has got us, man. He's got us in his grip. Kept by the power of God through our faith, though. You got faith so he can hold on to you for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Yes. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved with various trials. Ugh. What? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's necessary that the faith be tested. And Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and 12, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice. Rejoice. Oh, sure, that's, that's just how I feel about all that. That's why we've got to have a great faith, brother. We've got to keep reading that information. We've got to see how consistent the scripture is. Job maintained, Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know I'm going to see him in my flesh in the last day on this earth. I know that he lived. Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. When you see those apostles in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul telling the church, you guys reign and you're reigning like kings. Wish you did reign. Maybe we could reign with you, he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You're already full. You're reigning. You're rich. Reigning like kings without us. Indeed, I wish you did reign. May we reign with you. I think that God has displayed us the apostles last as men condemned to death. We've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and men. We're fools for Christ's sake. Well, you're wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're distinguished, but we're dishonored. To this present hour, we both hunger, thirst. We're poorly clothed. We're beaten. We're homeless. We labor, working with our own hands, being revealed vowed we bless being persecuted we endure being defamed we entreat we've been made like the filth of the world the offscoring of all things till now now i ain't writing these things to shame you but as my beloved children i warn you see that's what that roman ruler was trying to point out to paul look at you look at where you're at look at where your people are at what good is this where's your god man can you imagine apostles working from cane to cane, hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, beaten and homeless? Does that look like the winning team? It's biblical. It's biblical. So why should anybody who professes to be a Christian in 2018 expect anything less? Was it just a bad time back then or something? We're going to close with Romans 8. Uh, you might be thinking, I thought he said that a few minutes ago. <laughs> Romans 8. Well, what are we going to say to these things then? Romans 8, 31. Well, what shall we say to these things? Well, if God is for us, well, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Well, who's he who condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore, he's risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also make intercession for us? Well, then who will separate us from the love of Christ? How about tribulation or some distress or maybe some persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it's written, for your sake, we're killed all day long. We're, we're counted like sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who... More than. We're not just winning. We're winning. We have a decisive victory. It's not going to be by two points. It's going to be by a mile. A country mile. Through him who loved us. I'm persuaded, Paul said, neither death nor life or angels or principalities or powers or things present or things to come or height or depth. That ought about just about cover it or every other, any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus 
our Lord. That's what it's all about, pilgrims. See, everybody wants it to go away. The people I talk to, I know they're suffering. I know they're hurting. I know they're fear. I would love to make it go away, but that would be a big mistake. You take that stuff away, it's like, remember the moth or the caterpillar, not the caterpillar, the butterfly thing. You know, the butterfly in there trying to get out of the cocoon. And if you think, oh, I'll help him out, get a razor blade and slice that thing so that monarch can fall out of there, you'll kill it. It needed that struggle to get out of that cocoon so when it popped out of there, he could fly. That's what it does. It strengthens their wings so they can fly. You go and zip that thing for them and let them fall out on the floor, that's where they'll be and they'll die. It's the trials that refine us and perfect us. It's God's grace, Jesus said, is sufficient for us. His strength is perfected in our weakness. Therefore, we can take pleasure in infirmities and distresses and necessities and persecutions for Christ's sake. For when we are weak, then we are strong. That message is 2,000 years old. It's relevant in 2018, and it ain't never going to change. Don't look for Christianity to be the easy way in this world. Because that is not biblical in scripture, Jesus said, cannot be broken. Thank you for your attention this morning.